Good morning and welcome to Rye Hill Baptist Church for Sunday morning, March the 1st, 2020. This morning's message brought to us by Senior Pastor Michael Franklin is entitled, Satan's Dangerous Deceptions. And we are going through the book of Acts, so we are going verse by verse and line by line. And if you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 8, and we will be starting in verse 9. Acts 8, 9. And we remember last week the burial uh, of Stephen. We remember uh, Saul was making havoc of the church. But what Satan means for bad, God meant for good. And uh, there were many people saved, uh, as it says in eight. Uh, chapter 8, verse 8, and there was great joy in the city and there was revival. And I thank God for revival. And if you want to follow along with us and take notes, it's in your bulletin, the outline, Satan's Dangerous Deceptions. Satan's Dangerous Deception. And folks, I'm telling you right off the bat, Satan is a liar. Okay? He makes right wrong and wrong right. And we need to be aware of his ploys. We need to watch uh, and, and really, really watch who we are watching and who we are listening to uh, because I know there are many false prophets according to the Word of God. Let me go ahead and give you the outline. Number one, a wrong view of salvation. A wrong view of salvation. This town... Uh, did not get it. Number two, a wrong view of the Spirit. Wrong view of the Spirit. And by the way, folks, there are many spirits. But there's just one Holy Spirit. Okay, and I'll prove that to you in Scripture in just a few minutes. Then number three, an issue of the heart. An issue of the heart. And folks, that's where Jesus comes into. That's where the Holy Spirit comes into. He doesn't come into your head. He comes into your heart. And we will help you with that in just a few minutes. As we look at our Scripture text, there is a basic principle that we need to be reminded of. Where God is at work and the Holy Spirit is doing His work, Satan will be sure to do everything he can to stop the work of God. One way the devil does this is with counterfeit and false teachers. This is a truth Jesus dealt with in His earthly ministry. And John the Baptist also encountered the same issue. Sometimes Satan comes through the front door like a roaring lion, lion devouring everything he sees. And at other times he sneaks in the back door and slowly deceives people in order to get a foothold into a situation or a church. In Acts 8, Satan's tool was a sorcerer named Simon. And the Apostle Paul wrote of this very thing. Hold your finger there in Acts chapter 8 and go with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 12. But what I do, and I love to hear those pages turning. Isn't that a beautiful sound? But what I do, I will also continue to do that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded uh, just as we are in the things in which they boast. And Paul here, and we don't have time to go into the background here, but he was talking about false apostles. There are false teachers. There are false preachers. There are false apostles. Verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into uh, in two apostles of Christ, which means they were self-appointed, self-called. And no wonder, now listen to this, for Satan himself transfer, transforms himself into an angel of light. He can appear to be something that he is not. And we need to understand that, folks. We need to be able to, uh, through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to discern the difference. Okay? That is so, so important. And that's the two keys, folks. The keys to discerning truth from a lie is first the Word of God. It's God's infallible Word. 
All right? I don't care what man says. I don't want man's opinion. I want to know what the Bible says about things. And also, we have the Spirit of God. Folks, I can turn my television on and listen to somebody probably, probably for five or six minutes and know whether I need to be listening to this person or not. Because my spirit tells me, yes, it bears witness with this person, or no, I do not need to be listening. And folks, uh, we are going to share with you some Scripture that shows that and proves that. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 8. Verse 9, Acts 8, verse 9, a wrong view of salvation. But there was a certain man called Simon who was previously practiced sorcery in the city and admonished the people of Samaria, claiming to be he was someone great. Folks, I always worry, and not worry is the word, but I am concerned about people that have big egos, that they act like they're God's gift to the ministry. Folks, we are nothing without Christ. We can't do anything without Christ. And here you see, and it says previously practiced, but I am telling you the evil part, that demonic part is hard to break away from. It is. It is not impossible because all things are possible with God. But Simon, Magnus is the word, uh, is, is his other name there. He had had his claws into this city for many, many years. And he was deceiving the people there. Matter of fact, some people believe historically that Gnosticism started with him. And it was developed later on because Paul the Apostle had to go against that. And by the way, if you look up a Gnosticism on, uh, on the computer, you, it will confuse you. I'm telling you, I could not understand the definition. But let me tell you what it is. Here's what it boils down to. God did not create the world and Jesus is not the Messiah. That is false teaching, folks. That is wrong. All right? It is a man-made religion. And folks, we don't follow man. We follow God. And that's what he is. That This, this, this Simon uh, took hold of this city and, and just act like he ruled over them and act like he was more spiritual than them. And then he tells them why. To, uh, to whom, verse 10, they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. They were mistakenly wrong. And folks, people can be sincere in their beliefs, but they can be sincerely wrong in their beliefs. And this power of sorcery, these tricks and these magicians and these things that were happening, folks, they're, they are not anything new. It goes back to uh, Exodus, all right? And, and Pharaoh and his magicians. You think about it. God told uh, Aaron and, and Moses what to do and they threw down uh, the staff and it turned into snakes and they did it themselves. His magicians did it even though uh, you know theirs gulped up the other ones, uh, Moses's and Aaron's. Folks, I'm telling you, Satan is real. Demons are real. And they can influence people in an extremely bad way. But you know what? Folks, I am telling you, Satan cannot control, demons cannot control Christians. Christians. And I'm going to show you that here in just a minute. Now look what it says in verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ both men and women were baptized. And here's what I'm saying. There's a difference in believing in half faith and an intellectual assent. I've talked to many a person that says, well, I believe in God. Well, folks, it's not enough just to believe in God. What about Jesus? What about the Holy Spirit? What about the Word of God? Just because someone believes in God, and truthfully, unless you talk to them about that, you don't know whether their God is the big G of this Bible, the big God, Jehovah God of this Bible, or a little G, just many, many uh, gods that are out there. And the Bible tells us, it warns us about this. Look in 1 John chapter 4. Let me help you today. 1 John chapter 4. So that you can know the difference. So you can know the difference. 1 John 4, 
Verse 1, be loved. All right? There are good spirits, and good spirit is the Holy Spirit. There are bad spirits, and bad spirits are demonic activity. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Now look what it says. Test the spirits. We have that Holy Spirit inside of us to test these spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And by this you know the Spirit of God. Folks, I know when something... And, and again, sometimes I don't have to know exactly what their doctrine is or exactly know what they are saying. But when I listen to them, my spirit does not bear witness with them. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Folks, it's very important what you believe about Jesus. What these people are teaching about Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus lived a perfect life. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. And after three days, my Jesus rose again. And folks, we must understand, not everyone believes that. Matter of fact, Jesus said that some of these charlatans, some of these false teachers come in sheep's clothing. But on the inside, they are wicked and they have an agenda. They have an agenda. Look what it says. And this is the Spirit of of the Antichrist. We know what anti means. Against. The spirit of the Antichrist. Folks, it is prevalent in our world today. It is everywhere. It is on TV. It is on the internet. There are testimonies. You could just, I mean, you just, there's religions, religions after religions that don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God which you have heard was coming, is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because He who is in you is greater than He is in the world. Listen to me, folks. I have nothing to fear. Man, God is inside of me. God protects me. The Holy Spirit gives me discernment. I am a child of the King. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know, here it is, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Oh, listen to me, folks. Many people have erred. They are wrong in what they believe. And I am telling you, God gives us the spirit of truth. And the truth is the Word of God. We should be able to know the difference. Matter of fact, just look at James. The book of James. Just turn back a few more chapters there. James chapter 2. James 2. Verse 14. James 2.14 What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? There are people that believe that you... You, you can work your way to heaven, folks. That is not what the Bible says. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one says to you, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And folks, there are people that have dead faith. It's just dead. It's their ideology. It's what they believe. Now look at verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. My faith in Christ saves me. And when I am saved, folks, works will follow. Works will follow. And I'm going to show you a Scripture at the end of the service about that. And here's the one I wanted to get to. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Hey folks, have you ever read that verse? The demons believe. They know. They have an intellectual assent of God. 
But I got news for you folks. They're not going to heaven. They're not. So there's this spirit of the Antichrist, this spirit of error that is in our world. And people are being fooled and people are being deceived. Now let's look back in our text. Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. You remember Jesus when he was doing his earthly ministry? You realize that he would leave towns because of the miracles that he did? More people were believing in the miracles than in Jesus Christ Himself. And folks, I'm telling you, there is deception there. Miracles will not save you. Jesus Christ will save you. And that's what is going on here. Philip, yes, he is evangelist. Yes, Philip preached the Word of God. But I am telling you, according to Scripture, which I'm fixing to show you in just a couple of minutes, they did not truly know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And Simon was enamored. He was, he was, you know, it was just like, oh man, they're doing things better than I am doing. They're doing things in a miraculous way. And I want, they said they followed Philip. He wanted to know how Philip uh, uh, could uh, get their attention and how all this was going on. But he was doing it for personal gain. Okay? And that's what is going on. The wrong view of salvation, folks. It is in Jesus Christ. I always ask myself this, folks. How could someone like Judas Iscariot how could he follow Jesus for three years at least and not know Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior? What, what was his issue? I'll tell you what his issue was. It was money. Why? Because he sold Jesus out for money. 30 pieces of silver. Okay? And he was trusted. All right? He was the treasurer. So I'm telling you, and it reminds me of the parable uh, that Jesus spoke about of the wheat and the tares. The wheat is... Is, is full of grain. The wheat heads have grain in them. And the tares are empty when you bust those open. And you only know at the reaping time who is a wheat and who is a tare. And folks, I got news for you. I know I am saved. I know Christ is in my life. And you know that whether He is or He isn't. And God knows also. And there's going to be a day of judgment. You will not run. You will not hide. You will stand before God and give an account of your life to God according to the Word of God. But here is a wrong view of salvation. And not only was there a wrong view of salvation, there was a wrong view of the Spirit. Now hang on. Hang on here. I want to show you this. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the Word, they sent Peter and John to them who, when they come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet, he, uh, he had fallen up on, up on none of them. Now folks, we believe that you, when you are saved, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And what it is saying is, it's more than just saying a prayer. Anybody can say the sinner's prayer. But listen to me, folks. There is 12 inches between head knowledge and knowing Christ as your personal Lord and Savior in your heart. For several years, I went to church. For several years, I listened to preaching. For several years, I did everything. As a matter of fact, I made two false professions of faith. One was when I was five years old. An evangelist come in town and he had a white suit on and I'd never seen a white suit in my life. Halfway through the sermon, he had the white coat off and he threw it back there and he was sweating and spitting. And the last thing I can remember him saying, if you don't want to go to hell, you get yourself down here. Folks, I was five years old and he scared me half to death. 
I ran down the aisle. And you know the other thing I like about that? You'll, this is going to date me. But when you got baptized, those new Polaroid cameras where you took it and they come out at front, they did that for all the baptism. And I thought, that is pretty cool. I did. I'm just telling you the truth about this is my personal testimony. And I'm telling you, I rocked along there and, uh, you know, I thought I was saved, but, I, you know, the older I got, the more I realized, you know, that I just, I just, I wanted to, but I just didn't understand it. I didn't understand it. And then when I was 14 years old, I went to a place called Falls Creek. And a lot of people know it's a huge youth encampment in Oklahoma. And I remember on a Friday night, God convicted me. And I remember going down the aisle. I remember crying. I remember that. But as I went through high school in the first part of college, I am telling you, I basically what I said, God, I will come to you, but I'm going to come on my terms. I don't want to give up this, and I don't want to give up that, and I don't want to do this. And folks, I made two false professions of faith. And then when I was 22 years old, folks, I'm telling you, Bailey Smith came to town and he rocked my world with the wheat and the tares. I realized for the first time, being in church for 22 years doesn't save you. I'm telling you, I went down the aisle in front of over 3,000 people in the Great uh, Plains Coliseum in Lawton, Oklahoma, and I gave my life to Christ and He changed me from the inside out. I got saved. I, got, I received the Holy Spirit in my life and God changed me. He changed me. Now look, at, now look what it says here. And it says in verse 18, and then Simon saw that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Spirit was given and He offered them money. What did he want? He wanted that power. That power. And folks, he made a false profession of faith. These folks that were following Simon, and what were they doing? They were following a man. You do not follow a man. You follow God. You follow the Word of God. You follow God Himself. You follow Jesus what am I? I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Man will deceive you, but I am telling you, God will save you. He offered him money. Look at verse 19. Give me this power also that anyone whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. It was all about Him. It wasn't about God. It wasn't about salvation. Simon had deceived a whole town. And, then, and while Philip shared the gospel, folks, I'm telling you, uh, 2 Corinthians, look at, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 12. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For as the body is one, we're talking about the body of Christ, and has many members, but all members uh, but all the members of that body, being many, are one body. What is the body? It's the body of Christ. It's saved, folks. Okay? Also is Christ. For by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body. What Spirit? The Holy Spirit. And we believe that at the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and saves you. And I'm telling you, that's how you know you're saved. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made into drink, in, to drink into one Spirit. One Spirit, folks. And that is the Spirit of God. So the question is, why had the Holy Spirit not fallen on these folks in Samaria. I jotted down six reasons why I believe this happened. This is the reasons for the Samaritans not receiving the Holy Spirit. First, I believe they were following man. First, they followed Simon and then they followed Philip. The second reason I believe why the Holy Spirit didn't fall till the apostles got there was because God can do anything He wants to do. He delayed it for a specific reason 
and a specific purpose. And I believe that person, that, that reason was for the unity of the body of Christ. You have to understand, historically, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along. Okay? For years, they even worshipped and their temples were in two different places. And I am telling you, uh, uh, you know, they, they just they bitterly really hated one another and believed what they were doing were right and what God was wanting to do. He was wanting to unite those two churches and those two people. All right? And if the separate thing had happened, you probably would have had this huge church in Jerusalem where Jewish people were, but remember the Great Commission. All right, in, in, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. And then you would have, if this happened, then this big revival broke out like that, it would happen in Samaria. And most likely, there would have been two churches there competing, all right, and still not unified in the body of Christ. Acts is a transitional book. It is a book between the Gospels and the Epistles. And there are many wonders and mighty things and things that have happened in the book of Acts, all right, that, that, that just propelled them uh, into the, the Epistles. Matter of fact, what we have, and folks, we have such an advantage. We have a written Word of God, a full Bible. Back then, all they had was the Old Testament. The New Testament had not even been written that written yet. So that enlightenment had not fully developed yet. And then the sixth reason, I believe, is the apostolic authority of the apostles. God, for that time and that purpose and that reason, gave them that supernatural power to authenticate the Gospel and Christianity. And we remember in Acts chapter 3, which we've already studied, a lame man was laying there and he was begging and he was wanting mon money and Peter looked at him and said, silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And this lame man walked. And I'm telling you, in that, Peter and John were persecuted for what they believed. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Let me show you this. Ephesians 4. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord. This is Paul writing to uh, the church at Ephesus. Prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering and bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now here's what I want you to see. There is one body. That is the body of Jesus Christ. There is one Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. Just as you were called with one hope, our hope is in Jesus Christ and Him coming again of your calling. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. Folks, I got dunked twice. I got wet twice. And then I truly received uh, the Spirit of God and I was scripturally baptized and it meant so much more to me than my first two were. One God. One Father of all. Who is above all and through all and in, in you all. Oh, listen to me, folks. We have to do it God's way. We have to come on God's terms. We have to obey the Word of God. We have to obey the Spirit of God. And God will save you. So we see a wrong view of salvation. We see a wrong view of the Spirit. But here's the key, folk. It is an issue of the heart. An issue of the heart. Go back with me to Acts. Go back to Acts. Verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 20. Verse 20, Simon had offered him money for this power. And that's what all it was, folks. He just wanted to be worshipped. He wanted the people to believe that he was better than everybody else and that he was mightier than everybody else and he was more spiritual than everyone else. But, but, but Simon was lost, folks. 
he was lost. Verse 20, but Peter said to him, your money uh, perish with you because you thought that the gift of God be, would be, could be purchased with money. Folks, you can't buy your way to heaven. You can't. You don't have enough money. Folks, I am telling you, salvation is free, but it costs God His Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 21, you, neither have, neither, uh, you have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Folks, that's the issue. Is Jesus in your heart? Is the Holy Spirit in your heart? Do you know for sure that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? Folks, First John tells us these things are written that we may know that we have eternal life. You can know. And the problem is in the heart with Simon. Look at verse 22. Repent therefore of this wickedness. Peter is talking to him. And pray, God, if perhaps the thought... Uh, per, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. It's still the heart. His heart was deceptive. His heart was all about money. His heart was all about him. His heart was all about power. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Iniquity, which was sin. Sin was the motive in what Simon was doing. Folks, the heart is the issue. Romans 10. Go with me to Romans 10. Verse 9. Romans 10, verse 9. You know this. This is part of the Roman road. That if you confess, that's pray, with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe that is faith in your heart. I've underlined heart in red. Folks, it's an issue of the heart that God has raised Him from the dead. You will be saved. You can be saved. Verse 10, For with what? The heart one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Folks, I am telling you, there are people that are 12 inches from heaven. 12 inches from heaven. Not only, I'm telling you folks, there are people that are 12 inches from hell also. They have believed a lie. It is not intellectual assent. It is not going, coming to church. It's not being baptized. It's not being a good per person. It is knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and inviting Him into your heart and giving your heart and life to Jesus Christ. It is repenting of your sins. And that's what he is saying. The issue with Simon was heart. Now let's finish this up. Look at verse 24. Acts 8.24 Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come unto me. There are people that believe that you can pray people into heaven, folks. That is not what the Scripture says. You have to pray. You have to confess. Peter could not save Simon. Peter told him, repent. Tell Jesus you were wrong. Tell God you were wrong. And invite Him into your heart. But he didn't get it. Simon asked him to pray for him. Verse 25, So when they had testified and preached the Word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the Gospel in many many villages of the Samaritans. As we close, I want to use one more Scripture with me. Go with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. And folks, this is Jesus' words. Jesus' words. Satan has deceived people. Satan is dangerous. Do not believe the lies of Satan. Matthew 7.13 Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Why do you have small gates? Because not a lot of things are going through that. Not a lot of people are going through that. Why do you have broad gates? Because there will be a crowd. Jesus is warning these folks. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way 
that leads to life. And there are few who find it. I'll listen, folks. You don't go on your terms. You come, you come to God on His terms. You follow Jesus Christ. You repent of your sins. And you do what the Word of God says. Now look at verse 15. Beware for false prophets uh, who have come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inly, inwardly they are ravenous, ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Folks, it, it's either you're saved or you're not. You're either going to heaven or you're not. Either there's fruit or there's not. Verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown to the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Now, I believe this is some of the saddest Scripture in all the Word of God. Look at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. There are people that believe if you just pray the prayer, you're in. But folks, it is more than that. It is giving your heart and your life to Christ. It is truly repenting of your sins. It is truly knowing Jesus Christ was perfect and that He died from your from uh, He He died for your sins and He arose again. Look what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders in your name? I mean, that was Simon all over, folks. He did these things. He did these things. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Folks, does God know you? Does He truly know you does he know you i never knew you depart me who practice lawlessness oh listen to me folks i pray you haven't been deceived i pray you do not listen to the lies of the devil i pray that maybe today even you have come face to face with salvation and folks your eternal destiny depends on it Father, thank You for the Word. God, I know Satan is alive and Satan has fooled a lot of people. And God, I pray that uh, You would just bind him. God, I pray that Your Spirit and Lord, the Word of God would just speak to our hearts during this time of invitation. God, if there's just one here that doesn't know You, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray that we would realize that eternity is forever. They weren't brought here by just some chance or, or some happenstance. God, I believe that our, there are people here that today is a divine appointment and You're speaking to people about salvation. And God, maybe they are saved. Maybe some are saved, but some need to rededicate their life to Christ. They had not been living the life that they know they should live. Maybe some need to follow the Lord in baptism. Maybe they were like me at one time and made a false profession of faith and then truly they need to be baptized. And then Lord, if there's folks here that want to join our church, God, they know who we are. They know what we're about. We're about Jesus and we're about the Word of God. It's all about Jesus. So God, I pray that Your Spirit would just move in and amongst us. And God, I pray that everyone here will look at their own life and see their own life and make sure they know that they know that they know. God, thank You for that assurance. Thank You that we can know. God, this is Your invitation. This is Your church. I pray that You would speak to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, will you come? 